Welcome back everyone to the last session of the day. I'd just like to take a moment to remind all participants that live captioning is available and also that every session is going to be recorded um, for future viewing and will be made available to everybody who has registered in the days to come. Please uh, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions, and we will not be individually identifying anyone, um, anyone who has a question. As in other sessions, due to the number of participants, um, it's likely that we won't be able to get to all of them, but we uh, will, of course, do our best to address as many as we can. Our final session of the day addresses regional museums making difficult decisions and expanding horizons and will be moderated by Laura Roberts. As a consultant, Laura works with cultural nonprofits on strategic planning, assessment, staff and board training, and organizational development. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Emily. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to participate in the symposium. I want to introduce um, our panelists first. Uh, Jessica Arb Daniel is the current board president of the Everson Museum of Art. She's also the principal of her art advisory firm, Jessica, Jessica Arb Daniel Art Advisory. She is joined uh, by Elizabeth Dunbar, the director and CEO of the Everson Museum of Art in Syracuse, New York. And I want to say at the outset that we, um, while it's wonderful to be here this way together, we all regret that we're not uh, at in Syracuse and able to experience the wonderful Everson Museum of Art. And we'll see um, the staircase of the Everson behind Elizabeth when she logs on. Elizabeth McGraw, known as Buzz, was on the board of the Berkshire Museum from 2008 to 2020. She was, and she was president during the latter part of the museum's strategic planning process and the decision to deaccession. And finally, Van Shields is the former director of the Berkshire Museum worked with its trustees to create a master plan for financial sustainability that was funded in part by the deaccessioning. So often the discussion um, of deaccessioning is dominated by the issues in larger art museums, with very little attention paid to how these challenges play out in smaller regional museums, which as Aaron Richardson reminded us this morning, are places that often have more limited resources and options and a different relationship to their communities and audiences. Many of them, like Pittsfield, where the Berkshire Museum is, have other collections and areas of interest in addition to art. There are, of course, hundreds of regional museums across the country, and we need to ask the question, how can guidelines and standards reflect their reality? This panel includes both staff and board, from two regional museums that face the difficult decision to deaccession, one before the pandemic and one after in 2020. So to give you a little bit of context for these institutions, I've asked the directors and the presidents to answer one very short question um, as, as, as briefly as they can. I'm asking the directors, Elizabeth and Van, what's the museum's mission plus one or two more things we need to know about the Everson and then about the Berkshire Museum. Elizabeth? Thank you, Laura. Uh, happy to be here. Glad to be wrapping up day one here um, of, of the symposium. Um, I want to start out by saying, first of all, uh, the Everson Museum of Art is not part of Syracuse University. I think there um, are some folks out there that believe we are part of Syracuse University. We are located in the lovely uh, Syracuse city um, here in downtown Syracuse, but we are not affiliated with the university. Um, here downtown, we serve approximately 60,000 visitors annually, um, and a, a large number, the, the majority of those visitors are from the area or from our community. 
Um, our mission statement reads through dynamic and meaningful encounters with modern and contemporary American art. The Everson engages diverse communities, inspires curiosity and lifelong learning and contributes to a more vital and inclusive society. A few things that um, you might know, not know about the Everson is that we, we are really known as a pioneering museum. We were one of the first museums to collect American art. We were founded back in 1897. We were one of the first museums to collect and exhibit uh, ceramics as a fine art medium. One of the first to establish a docent program and welcome school children as visitors. The first, of course, to commission architect I.M. Pei for a museum building, and you see our staircase behind me. The first to establish a video art department and collection, and the first to launch a, a cafe coming soon featuring artist-made ceramics for use. So uh, that'll be coming later this year, and um, we're very proud of that. Thank you. Van. What's the mission of the Berkshire Museum and what's one or two things we should know about it? Unmute Van. We still don't have it. There we go. Um, sorry about that. Thank you all for the opportunity to participate. The Berkshire Museum mission is to bring people together for experiences uh, that spark creativity and innovative thinking by making inspiring educational connections among art, history, and natural science. Uh, it was founded in 1903 and it's, it was chartered in 1932 uh, as a museum uh, for the people of Pittsfield, Pittsfield and the Berkshires. Uh, and it has played that role ever since. Uh, when it was founded, it was the only cultural institutions in, in Western Massachusetts in the area. Uh, and of course, now it is surrounded by a significant number of nationally important and regionally important institutions, including the Clark, Mass Mocha, Tanglewood, Jacob's Pillow, and so on and so on, the Norman Rockwell. Um, it's, um, so it has the context with when it, with, uh, that it operates within has changed pretty dramatically over the past century. Uh, and, um, and in response to that, the museum has slowly evolved uh, to really focus on uh, its audiences uh, and, uh, uh, in, and especially in, in terms of serving people that are traditionally underserved. Uh, and it's known today and distinguished for its very robust uh, school programs. Thank you. Jessica, what are a couple of things we need to know about Syracuse? About Syracuse specifically? Um, oh, sure. Um, well, it's cold. I should state that, obviously. Um, but, you know, the people of Syracuse, the city of Syracuse, um, they care about their community, their neighbor. People pick up the phone. Um, it's collaborative. Um, it's beautiful. I think one of the things it's important to mention is that the city is 50% black, indigenous, people of color. Um, poverty rates have come down, but it is still one of the poorest cities in the country. Um, you know, we the Everson itself sits on stolen lands of the Haudenosaunee people. It is the center of sort of where a failed urban renewal projects for um, the displaced the black community um, back in the 60s. Um, but it is having a renaissance, completely having a turnaround. Uh, we do see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I think that the Everson is part of that um, as it's sort of cultural hub. I'll work Thank on my you. brevity, sir, <laughs> for the next one. Thank you, Buzz. And what's a couple of things that we need to know about Pittsfield? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you also for having me. Um, so Pittsfield is located in the center part of our county. It's the western part of the state. Uh, we're bordered by Vermont, New York, and Connecticut. So there's definitely, you know, other state influences. Um, but Pittsfield itself was a GE town. 
And GE sadly pulled out in the mid 80s, leaving behind, um, you know, a big hole and a big polluted hole. Um, also other industries have since left. Uh, it's kind of like an all American city and sort of post-industrial decline to some extent. It's trying very hard to uh, foster innovation and um, further industries coming in, but you know, Sabic left in 2017. There is a projected population decline. It's at about 120,000. That's the entire county uh, down from 100. It's heyday and 150,000. And with that comes increased teen pregnancy, poverty. It's an aging demographic. Um, the good side is that we are a beautiful location uh, that has a wealth of cultural institutions, um, but and as well as second homeowners and tourism as an industry. Uh, one of the issues, though, that the museum faced is that there are well over a thousand nonprofits in Berkshire County, from the health and human services to the cultural institutions. And with this changing demographic, declining donor base, there it's very challenging, and there's high competition, especially uh, regionally, for regional nonprofits. So I, I hope that sets the stage for uh, your next visit to the Berkshires. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So this is a panel about the challenges in these regional museums. And so as specifically as possible, what makes these issues different in these museums when you're, de when you're not, as Erin said this morning, when you're not dealing with the Met or MoMA or the Whitney? Um, how are the issues that we've been discussing all day different in these smaller museums? Well, I would say here in Syracuse at the Everson, um, you'll you'll see that our our board of trustees is comprised of mostly civic leaders uh, or individuals who are wishing to give back to their community in some way. Um, we have worked really hard to uh, invite folks who represent all aspects of our community but very few um, are art collectors. Um, and I'd say we don't have maybe a, a single billionaire either on our board. So um, they have a, uh, an enormous task in front of them in, in trying to raise the funds to keep the museum's general operations going, uh, much less invest in other aspects of our, our museum work. Okay, what other issues. Van? Well, I think that for museums like the Berkshire Museum, and I suspect for the Everson, you're so grounded in your community um, that you, you know, it, it's, it's, that becomes the sort of uh, context and point of relevance for everything that you do. Uh, I've worked in New York City where, you know, our, our museum was not grounded in the community, uh, and it didn't need to be. Um, and uh, I think that's very different, uh, especially in communities that are in distress. Uh, and it's, uh, it is a, it's an important issue uh, because it's, uh, you know, we, we like to say we are for the community. That's what we do. Okay. I, I would follow up uh, on that, Van, to say that at least here at the Everson, we, we are the only art museum in town. We are the cultural center. Um, of Syracuse. So um, we need to serve everyone in our community, um, you know, from the fifth grade student to uh, seniors coming for art classes to traveling tourists um, coming through to uh, see, see our collection. So, um, you know, we, we can't focus on one particular thing in, in terms of uh, what we do. I'd say for the most part, we are like many other regional museums in that we don't have a large endowment to support us. Um, and uh, certainly very small um, resources available to us for collecting. So for making acquisitions for the collection. So, you know, our, our job is to keep the doors, uh, doors open, the museum running, keeping our staff employed um, and contributing as, as much as we can to our community. Board members, Jessica and Buzz, do you have any observations on this? Well, I would echo similar, I'm sorry, I interrupt, um, similar issues that we we are facing, you know, with a, a board that's very committed and dedicated to the community, but the there are very few billionaires, 
let alone no millionaires. So it's a, it's a difficult uh, road of hoe. Um, I also think with regard to Pittsfield, it, it's a changing, in the last 30 years, there have been so many changes to the county um, in terms of just declining jobs, uh, aging population, increased need in social services and health and human services. Um, and so there's a, there's a very dynamic change going on. And in the case of the Berkshire Museum, we were a single patron donor model. We had one family that would perpetually give money. And as things change, their ability, they're still very generous, but their ability to offset our deficit was stopped, started to happen in the 80s. And so it was kind of this perfect storm of, uh, of a funding crisis. Mm -hmm. Jessica, do you have anything to add before we move on to the next question? Okay. Um, Buzz, you said when we met to discuss this that the important issue is identifying all the questions leadership needs to ask and answer uh, in thinking about these challenges. And for you, what were those questions? What are the questions that you have to answer? And second part, and projecting, you're not on the board anymore, has the pandemic and associated changes um, changed the questions that you think a board has to ask and answer? No, it's a very important question. And I think it's an obvious answer for me. And I, I've been watching some of the other panels. It, it's all about your mission. You really need to do a deep dive into the mission. I mean, I think an institution should do this periodically anyway, but when there's a crisis, the, the mission is so important and you need to ask, is it still relevant? How is it being carried out? Um, the way in which you're reaching the community, can it be improved? Who is your community? Should the mission change? Um, in the case of the Berkshire Museum, it's a great mission. It's to educate using art, science, and natural history. Um, and it, it didn't, didn't need to change, but it was the touchstone throughout our entire process of trying to figure out how to write this institution. And everyone on the board needs, and staff who are participating in this, need to understand the mission and all be stroking in the same direction, so to speak. And it, it, you need to put your own ego and your own perception of what a museum is to you aside and understand what does it mean for this specific institution so that you can then base all of your decisions on that. Um, and I think in terms of quickly, and I'll let others answer, in terms of the pandemic, it just reinforced uh, our importance in the community, especially in terms of educators as everything went to being online. Uh, the museum was really able to pivot from a place of strength at this point uh, to put out all these online um, uh, programming and things with uh, working with the teachers and asking them what do they need and how can we help? Uh, I'll let others chime in. Right. The rest of you, what are the other questions that you think a board and senior leadership have to ask when they think about the, the decision to deaccession? I would say for the Everson, uh, 2020 was uh, a year of a lot of change and a time when we really needed to reevaluate, um, were, we, were we doing what we said we were going to do um, in terms of fulfilling our mission. And um, I'd say in the wake of George Floyd's murder, as well as the pandemic, we needed to show our community that we would step up, um, that you know, they, we are asking them to support us. We need to show that we are supporting them and doing what we need to be doing. Um, so I think, for us, that really moved things in a in a in a quickened, heightened um, direction to really show the community that we we stand behind our mission. And, and maybe Jessica will say more on that. Jessica, you also talked about the lenses that you use for decision making. You looked at this a different way. What were those? What are those lenses? Um, just to focus on the one question, I do think being a regional museum allows us to make nimble decisions as well. Um, Elizabeth and I are in constant communication along with the, most of the board. So I think that allows us to 
not have the red tape that bigger institutions have when it comes to something as big as the deaccessioning of the Jackson Pollock, um, which is an advantage to us. Um, you know, the, the, the lenses that I, I sort of, as a litmus test when I'm sort of making decisions are, is it mission driven? Um, can we afford it? Um, and is it equitable? Uh, with really emphasis on the on the last question, um, you know, with the deaccession, we followed those exact rules. I think a lot about, you know, if we were a for-profit business and there was a some sort of tax loophole change, and I was a CEO and I capitalized on that loophole, you know, I would be a, applauded. Um, but since we're an arts institution, we're always sort of like begging and having to be, you know philanthropists to bail us out, excuse me, bail us out. But that just, we don't have that in Syracuse. As Elizabeth said, we don't have one billionaire that I'm aware of yet, um, but I will find you if you move to Syracuse. Um, so, you know, for the Everson, that decision, I think really hit all of those sort of questions um, and allowed us to sort of pause the murder of George Floyd, the pandemic made us sort of pause and think, um, okay, what are our collecting priorities? What does our staff look like? What will the future of the Everson look like? Um, and how do we have a more representative, equitable collection? And now we can do it on a larger scale. Um, yeah. Well, and, and to add to what Jessica is saying there, I think the deaccession, you know, one, one of the key things that has come out of the pandemic for us is trying to find ways to be sustainable into the future. Um, the deaccessioning with the ability to put that money away to establish endowments that would enable us to uh, purchase work into the, first, in, into the future, as well as putting funds towards the direct care of our collection for perpetuity. So, um, you know, if there is another pandemic, is if there is some other disaster coming down the pipeline, which there surely will be at some point, um, we are, I wouldn't say we're completely protected, but we're in a much better position than we were a year ago. Dan, what lenses do you use as a director in thinking about this? Well, I, I wanna go back to the, the question you posed uh, about what are important questions for us to ask. And one of the ones that we thought was very important is, what does the community want? Uh, and what do they want from us? Um, we have um, very special resources. How can we use those resources to benefit the community? So I, I think the, the process that we went through of consulting with, with focus groups, with, with uh, uh, concerted committees of stakeholders of different stripes to, to go through answering those questions for us was very important. So I wouldn't, I think it's important for museums to, and I'm not saying uh, that this is typical, but I have certainly seen it to be arrogant about what, who they are and how they serve and what is good for this community and so on, so on. So I think asking the community what they want is, is very important and stakeholders. And by the way, you're gonna get criticized either way, uh, no matter how many, how many people you ask, uh, if you do something as dramatic as, as what we did. Uh, and then lenses for decision-making, I think it's, it's just, it's sort of a, a process of, you know, um, what, what does the community uh, want? Uh, what, um, what are the resources that you have to think about deploying to meet those needs? Um, and um, I think that um, uh, for us, the, uh, the big lens was, um, you know, can we keep the doors open? and serve this community. That was the most important issue for us. Uh, no matter how you look at it, we were facing an existential threat. And of course, now everybody's facing an existential right. threat. Um, I do wanna just acknowledge that we have a lot of very specific questions in the Q&A and we will get to them, but I wanna uh, continue a more general conversation about the issues facing regional museums before we get to the specifics of either case. Um, so, when we were preparing this, when I sent you out the questions, I had a question that talked about balancing stewardship and service. 
And I found it really interesting this morning and illuminating when Betsy Bradley basically redefined stewardship um, to being both care and sharing. Both um, collections management and service are two sides of the stewardship challenge. So, um, and, and that changed a lot of my thinking <laughs> since 10 o'clock this morning. Um, now, obviously that question of service isn't new. John Cotton Dana raised that a century ago. Um, but how do you all think about that duality of care and share of collections management and service as you allocate resources, as you set directions, whatever? Um, Elizabeth, maybe we'll start with you. So, um, you know, I, I thought this morning was also very interesting in the end, uh, you know, there were some discussions or comments about, you know, this kind of either or, is it collections or community and why can't we do both? Um, I think in our case, we are a community supported museum. Um, what we are here for is to um, be here for our community. And so we, we need to think about how we're engaging them. Um, however, you know, we also need to think about caring for the collection that we have. But I think even, I wouldn't say more importantly, but I would say making that collection as representative of the community as possible is really important to us. Um, as we've heard earlier today, the you know cities are changing, their demographics are changing. Uh, Syracuse, um, as Jessica mentioned, is you know 50 more than 50 percent non-white. So when we're looking at our collections, and there are 90 percent white male artists that are represented. Um, we have to do something about that. Uh, so for us, the deaccessioning and caring for the collection um, also had a very, um, you know, it, it was just extremely important for us to acknowledge that all of those things um, have to be part of the equation. Uh so, Van, how do you think about this duality of stewardship of, um, of caring and sharing? We had a lot of discussion about that uh, in the context of our planning process, which went on for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, we had this, this feeling that we were stewards of the institution uh, and everything that it encompassed, including the collections, including the programs, whatever. but the most important stewardship was for this institution. Now that may be, um, you know, parsing words, but at the end of the day, it was really a unification of, as you suggest, has been mentioned earlier. It's, it's, they're together. They can't, they're inextricably linked in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, Jessica and Buzz, do you have anything to add to that? I, I do, just in terms of our collection and our crisis, we were running out of money. And so the reality is we couldn't even take care of our collection, let alone think about di diversifying it. I mean, we had issues with moisture and mildew in the basement. We had insulation problems that would literally cause, cause stalagmites to form on the gallery floor. Uh, we had water dripping from the ceilings because there was so much deferred maintenance. So there were issues with, and we didn't have enough money to insure our, our collection properly. So the question of even putting some of our most valuable pieces out and having a little kid with an educational program poking a pencil in it is a possibility. So we had a different layer of, of decision-making and issues that we needed to, to sort of look at. So, um, you know, and they're all real. They're all real issues that deserved consideration and, and led us to the point of where we, we got to. Thank you. And, and I would also add that many, I'm sure we're, we're very typical of other regional museums in that 
we have very limited resources for acquisitions. So, you know, our collections for the most part tend to be very idiosyncratic. Um, they came through, you know, 125 years or so of gifts from folks in our community for the most part, not a lot of purchases. And um, caring for that collection that may not have been very um, thoughtful in its um, in the way that it's been put together, you, you have to think about you know the expense of caring for a collection and what is most pertinent to our audience today. How has that audience shifted? And if we are truly trying to make an impact on the on the next you know, generation of museum goers and museum professionals and um, just the next generation, we have to be able to speak to them with a collection that represents their voices too. Um, just, you know, on the last panel with the artists, Deborah Cass, you know, how, how mind boggling was it for her to actually see artists um, represented in the museum that were making work that were like her. Um, how many times has, you know, a, a black child, we, we serve every fifth grade student in the Syracuse City School District. How many times have they come to the museum and, you know, not seen artists that look like them or make art that represents them? And we have to address that if we are going to be sustainable um, and vibrant and meaningful in the future. Um, so there's been a question in the in the chat about um, noting that you're both you're all talking about serving your communities, and yet there's nobody from your communities on this panel. So can you give me a sense of Van? You talked about a little bit of how you think about. Um, as fiduciaries, those of you who are board members, and as representatives of the public interest, how do you see your job of ensuring that the community has a voice um, in the, in the decision-making for your institution? And Jessica, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Um... In terms of, you know, specifically thinking about the accessioning, um, I think that we have a responsibility to report back to our community what we have done and what we plan to do with the deaccessioning money in a transparent way, which I feel that we have done. Um, we have a, a full a full task force, which is now a full committee um, that's tied to our board and our bylaws. Um, that reports back um, on everything that we do. And they are in the you know, middle of rewriting most of our policies, including looking at salary studies, right sizing our salaries, um, looking at unpaid internships and making sure that we never have an unpaid internship again for those barrier of, you know, barrier of entry into the arts. Um, you know, as for the public interest, the Everson is definitely not a yes board. We are not people who just sit around and, you know, vote yes and, and move on. Um, there are healthy discussions, just as what happened with the, the, the deaccessioning of the Pollock. Um, and every meeting is sort of filled with disagreements and agreements. And, and we always come back to the conclusion of sort of what serves our region and the Everson the best. Um, you know, my predecessors who are my mentors that were past board chairs negotiated debt, um, lost sleep over this museum, um, give, have given, you know, their own money. This is their biggest philanthropic um, endeavor ever. Um, and, you know, this, we, we raised almost $17 million for a capital campaign unlike any, any cultural institution in central New York. So we are invested in, in the Everson um, and this, the accessioning of the Jackson Pollock unlocked immense potential for this space. Um, and it was mission driven. 
it was equitable um, and it made sense financially. So, um, and then we will continue to, you know, report back on everything that we do. Thank you. And Buzz, as a fiduciary, how do you think about creating a permeable boardroom that um, uh, incorporates the, the views of the community? And this was a, a, a challenge for you as you develop the new vision and then as you uh, undertook the deaccessioning. Sure. I mean, I think transparency is key. And I know that we have been criticized for, for whatever reason, perception that to not be transparent. Uh, when the time came to announce the deaccessioning, it, it was six months prior to the actual sale of the artwork. Um, you know, posting all of the financials and you know, the decisions on the website, it's, it's accessible. I have not been on the board since September. However, I, I, I know that you can just call up any number of board members and find out what's going on or talk to the director. I mean, there's, there's open conversations if people are willing to ask and have a dialogue that's positive. Um, you know, I think that so much um, emotion has been spent uh, criticizing and demonizing the Berkshire Museum. And yes, that will remain part of the legacy of it. But the reality is the museum will remain open. And instead of just limping along, it's it will thrive because it listened to the community in the process of our planning. And it realized that they, they love the museum and they loved what, what goes on there. They wanted us to do more of it. <clears throat> they wanted it to refresh. They wanted it to remain relevant. They wanted it to walk in and have a new experience, yet have a familiarity. There's such a sense of nostalgia with most regional museums. I mean, these kids, kids grow up going there and they have permanent attachments to things. And that's the emotional aspect. We sold some things and it goes back to the museum was in a dire situation. And instead of making a decision that was going to just kick the can down the road, which they had done in the past, this was really to just right the ship. It was to create an investment fund to offset what they knew they couldn't earn. It was to have enough money to fix the leaky basement and the sewer line and things like that, which aren't necessarily glamorous fundraising projects. And now they're on the final, granted the pandemic kind of got in the way here, but now they're on the final phase of upgrading the exhibits, creating new classrooms, you know, fixing the lighting, creating a security system finally, you know, all these things that are so important to the, the running of the museum. So um, I think the doors are open, you know, come on in, ask questions. Yeah, so. Yeah, and we appreciate that, um, but we have to acknowledge that your decision provoked an unprecedented outpouring of um, criticism. Um, and, uh, and if you were reading the Q&A, the criticism is continuing. Um, and both local and national reaction. Um, and the organized opposition to what you did has not stopped three years later. Um, and I'm wondering if you have a sense, Van, of why this has continues to be, um, is it that you in fact did something wrong? Um, uh, were there things that you could have done better um, that maybe would have not left the Berkshire Museum being the touchstone in our field for, um, for this controversy? Um could always do things better. Uh, we thought we were doing things so well. The level of consultation that was guided, frankly, by our consultants, the people that we drew into the process, the discussions that we had uh, were so fluid and dynamic and it was really, really good. So we were not surprised that people were critical, but we were very surprised by the level of vitriol. And, uh, and that's been interesting to think about. I, I have a pet theory, which I've mentioned before, which is people are angry in general and they found a, a great target to be angry about. I think it's deeper than that. I think Buzz touched on it with the 
emotional attachment, the responsive cord that people have with specific uh, works. I think the, um, uh, the intrusion by some people from outside the community into the discussion uh, didn't help. But as far as what we would do better, um, I, you know, it, I think the reaction probably would have been the same no matter what, uh, it, 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 based on just selling the paintings. Uh, and what I'm saying is that I'm, I'm not sure what has caused this, what I would call sort of an irrational response to um, what seemed to be a good business decision at the time that was well informed, well thought out, uh, and and well presented. I, I I will be honest in saying that I think uh, the phrase "lost control of the narrative" is is something to be paid attention to. We never got a chance to really explain to the community what we were doing because every conversation we had was smothered uh, by this concern about selling the art, rather than what are you trying to achieve by selling the art. So I would encourage people that are thinking about this in the future to make sure that you are able to, to tell people what you're trying to achieve uh, at the same time. And I, I don't know how we could have, uh, uh, the local newspaper did not help in my opinion. Um, so I don't know what else. Well, I think you you, you also asked for like, what was the tension, you know? And I think that there's, and this is why you're having this symposium. There is a serious tension between those people that value the institution and what the mission is and what the institution is doing versus the collection and keeping the collection in the public eye. And therein lies the tension. And um, I was disheartened to see that there were people that would really rather see, would have rather seen the Berkshire Museum close and the museum remain in the public eye. Didn't matter if it would necessarily leave Berkshire County, but remain in the you know, public eye than to have this institution you know, remain healthy. And this was, I mean, so when you're having these crises, you really need to figure out um, how are you gonna carry out your mission and ask the question, you know, should you close? Should you merge? Should you move? We asked all of these questions and ultimately the board said, no, we need to stay an anchor to South Street in Pittsfield and remain open. And how can we do this? And while we're doing this, how can we keep our institution, you know, thriving? How can we address all of the other issues that over the last 30 or 40 years have been Oh, let's let another board deal with that. Let oh well, we'll let another you know. Oh, well that'll go away. La 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 la. Finally, it was at a point where it was right there in front of us. We needed to do something big, and it you can't make everybody happy. And I'm it is what it is. I'm you know I I'm glad that museum will remain open. So you thank you, and thank you both for your for taking that on. You've all talked about what you've been able to achieve because of your deaccessioning, or in the case of the Everson, what you hope to be able to achieve, what you plan to do with the funds. What's been lost? What has, what, in every tough decision, there are going to be um, pluses and minuses. And so what has, for both of you, has, what has been the downside of these decisions? And I'm gonna start with the Everson. It's a very recent decision, so you may not have that assessment yet. I'm still trying, yeah, I, I'm not sure at, at this point. Certainly there were, I'm sure some donors that were upset um, about losing um, a Jackson Pollock given, you know, who Jackson Pollock is. We, we are retaining another one. So, um, but I think there were folks in the community that Certainly we're not happy about that. Um, on the other side, I would also say I certainly got some hate mail um, and hate phone calls and a lot of other things um, 
from individuals who were upset that we would deaccession the Jackson Pollock to diversify our collection. That so I mean I think that just speaks to you know thing underlying racism in our well not even underlying but uh, you know how some people in our community um, feel about wanting to expand the canon um, and bring in other voices. Um, Jessica, maybe you have other thoughts on that. I, I agree. I mean, I think it has caused a few tough conversations with some um, rhetoric that is pretty um, terrible, um, but has also allowed us to have those conversations um, with people, with the public, uh, with some of our, um, I don't know, followers or people in the media. Um, and I think that's okay. I think we need to have those discussions. Um, ultimately, I think, you know, this, the accession, I think about as a, as a board chair, I think about what's going to drive outcomes um, for the success of the museum, you know, Elizabeth is more the visionary and the person who runs the institution. Um, and I just am here to help her along with the board. But I really think about, you know, this expansion of our collection will, you know, allow us to have a draw for the public, have more incredible art on the walls, which will have more people in the museum, which will ultimately drive revenue. So for me, that was ultimately a no brainer. Um, to go back to the question about our community and who we are, um, you know, if, if whoever asked the question would like to look at any of the demographics, I think that that is um, pretty transparent. And also, you know, we are trying to work on our, on our equity side to be more representative of our region. Um, somebody asked if any community members are involved in the collections committee that makes these deaccessioning decisions at the Everson. Absolutely. Um, and um, so I've gotten, we've gotten several conversations about finances. Um, and one of them is, um, so there's another leak at the Berkshire Museum. There's another um, significant piece of building maintenance that needs to be done. Um, do you feel as if the decisions that you've made, um, and in the case that I wrote for the book about the Delaware Art Museum, um, the comment was that the Delaware deaccession is going to be the test of whether or not a deaccession, a dramatic deaccession, solves a museum structural deficit once and for all. Um, and it hasn't yet at Delaware. Um, they still have a whole lot of fundraising to do. Um, now the Everson has not um, been quite in as bad financial stress as the Berkshire, but it, is this the decision that will ensure the museum's future um, or has it perhaps eroded the confidence of financial donors so that it's gonna be hard to raise money or It'll, it'll be perceived as not needing the money or has not enough been um, raised uh, through the sales in order to ensure being able to pay the roofer the next time around. Um, has, what has been the financial, the long-term financial implications of these decisions? Um, Buzz, do you wanna start with that? Sure, and they're all very good questions and I could talk for an hour about all this, but... Um, so the financial implications are never was the plan to stop fundraising and to end fundraising. And that was never the plan, but nevertheless, the impression. Uh, the museum raises anywhere from 800 to a little over a million dollars a year. The operating budget is around 2 million. So the hope was to create this investment fund to offset what we knew was just, it was like squeezing you know, water from a stone. Um, so prior to the pandemic, um, and while I was still on the board, fundraising was on par with where it had always been, if not better. Um, attendance was better 
uh, people were still coming to the museum, still happy to be um, in the museum. We had uh, done a big fundraiser to and allowed uh, free admission to everyone 18 and under into the museum. Um, so the data, you know, from the deaccessioning up to the pandemic was positive. As I said, I don't know how the pandemic is impacting everybody. Um, you know, admissions, everything has gone down. But as opposed to being from a place of panic during a pandemic, you know, the museum is financially stable enough and with PPP loans, uh, you know, they're, they're from a place of strength. So, you know, time will tell. Uh, but the donors that were involved in our decision making were thrilled that finally the money that they were donating was actually going to the programs and not necessarily having to pay the light bill. And, you know, they knew they, they were fully aware that the museum was in some pretty dire financial straits and had been for a while. Um. I can talk from the Everson's perspective in that the the funds generated from the sale of the Pollock don't go to you know fixing the roof. Um, they uh -huh. we can only use the proceeds for two purposes: for the acquisition of new works, um, as well as for the direct care of the collection. Uh, for years and years, we have not had adequate funding to care for the collection. There are years of deferred con uh, deferred conservation on artwork. So we're now able to take better care of our collection than ever before. So for us, it hasn't made um, a significant change to um, our operating budget. It really is directed towards diversifying the collection and taking care of it. Well, one of our um, um, participants asked how the Everton defines direct care. So we have a, a, a list of items that we are so, like many other institutions, um, are looking at um, for direct care costs. Uh, obviously storage, we, we are like every institution around the globe, out of storage space. We have multiple offsite storage locations. We have transportation costs related to that, um, care, conservation, consultants, all of those things are connected in terms of direct care. We're also um, utilizing a percentage of salaries um, for direct care in terms of like our registrars um, who are working exclusively or almost exclusively with the collection. So similar to, um, we'll, we'll hear more about this, I'm sure tomorrow um, on the session on what is direct care, but that's how we are defining it. Okay, thank you. Um, Jessica, you said that some of the, um, now that you've gotten has been negative about diversifying the collection. Um, and um, there, there are certainly, um, being a museum board member, being a museum leader, um, as, as Van said, there's a lot of questioning and second guessing that goes on. Um, what do you think, what do you perceive as being the, some strategies that you have found useful for, in, not for ignoring the controversy, not for putting your hands over your ears and hoping that it stops, um, but for engaging controversy, for taking it on and having the kind of constructive discussion that we say we want to have with our audiences and our communities when we come under criticism. Um, Any of you? <laughs> I Sure, I can start. I, I mean, one of the questions I always like to ask people is, um, do you know what color the Jackson Pollock was at our museum? Just <laughs> out of curiosity, because usually they don't. Um, so that is usually where I begin. Um, I wonder, 
I'm curious if it wasn't Jackson Pollock or and if it was um, another artist who wasn't a white male, if we would have the same, um, com you know, horrible things that were written to us. And, I, and this is like five people. I'm not talking like, you know, constant bar barrage of emails and phone calls. Um, but I do think this idea of what people think is cancel culture, which is not what was happening. It was really just, and I don't want to be flippant, but it was just a Jackson Pollock that was good, but could it could be used to completely transform the museum and our collection. Um, and in terms of you know what we can do to sort of thwart that. You know, we have a beautiful, brand new, completely renovated auditorium that needs sponsorship um, to have a plug there, but um, if you'd like your name on it, but to have, to use that space after the pandemic and people can sit close to one another as a place for thought discussions, for panel discussions. Um, you know, I would love to be that place to have those conversations. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually happy that we did deaccession it because it has allowed us to have these hard conversations. Okay. And it was red, the painting was red. <laughs> well, and I'd also say that when we decided to embark on this endeavor, um, we were very much in close contact with the Family Foundation uh, that represents the donor um, of the Jackson Pollock painting. And they were fully in support of this action. So we, we were you know, very transparent about this um, with our community, um, followed all of the guidelines, um, really tried to be as open and positive about this is you know, we don't see this as a as a as a negative um but and and as jessica said the jackson pollock as wonderful as, of a painting as it was most people did not even know that we owned it um and yeah but i mean they do now but <laughs> um at the time they they were not aware um of this painting um, so I do a lot of consulting with boards. I don't do fundraising, but I do a lot of consulting with boards. And, um, and I know that it's hard to get boards to raise money. Um, most boards would prefer to do something other than um, uh, do development. Um, do you think that your organizations had a sufficient commitment to fundraising? Or was this a easy way out? I can, I can start with that. Um, during the discussions of deaccessioning, one thing was very clear was that our board was not off the hook for fundraising. Um, you know, as Elizabeth said, um, it's only for direct care and and the collection and acquisitions. So everything else falls under the board's sort of fiduciary responsibility. And, um, you know, I think a lot about what Aaron Richardson said that boards are not banks, we are fiduciaries and we have to financially help, you know, balance the budget, but also fundraise, um, but we are not banks. And this was one way for us to diversify our collection and to right size some of the salaries with the people that were working under the collections. Um, so that would be my answer. Okay, Buzz, or Van, do you think this like- well, let, let, let me just say, uh, first of all, um, and I mean this with respect, this was not the easy way out. <laughs> it was very hard. It was very hard and it has been extremely hard on a lot of individuals as well as the institution. Very difficult. Um, we 
I, when I arrived there in 2011, within three weeks, I was summoned to uh, the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board in Boston with a message that they were going to shut us down because we hadn't fulfilled promises to them in the past. I mean, there were so many things that were sort of cascading down the hill on the museum, but I spent, you know, three, four years out there in the community. I talked to people about merging. I, somebody who's on another panel earlier today, I said, how about you absorb the Berkshire Museum? How about it becomes an educational outpost in Pittsfield? We raised money. We raised a new $5 million. Uh, we fixed the problem with the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board. Uh, we did a lot. And we, and we still counted on continued fundraising in the plan from the board and from everybody that had traditionally uh, supported us. And we were pretty confident based on discussions we had with those people because those people were consulted very carefully. You, you, you can be assured of that. Uh, the people that were helping us stay afloat at the time were consulted very carefully. Uh, and um, as Buzz has mentioned, they were, they were delighted that we were going to try to solve our problem. Uh, they also understood that we would still need their help in the future. So. Philanthropy was a big part of the plan. It just got lost. The, the same day we announced our new vision, we also announced the progress on a capital campaign, which we were restating what the capital campaign would be. That was barely even mentioned uh, from that point forward, unfortunately. So it wasn't well, it easy. No, it wasn't easy. And But yet, uh, uh, there's so much to say. Um, now <laughs> that the museum is in a place of strength, as I said before, there are plans to do capital campaigns targeted to specific uh, areas of the museum, specific projects, whether it be a fundraising for the theater reconfiguration or a variety of other, the aquarium, which was, we have an aquarium. We are not an art museum per se in the strictest sense. And the other reality that I think is lost, and it's so important because I am reading some of the questions we're a regional museum. The thought that we could draw from a national and international sources to raise millions of dollars is just not realistic in, in, in our current thinking because there are places like the Clark, Mass Mocha, Norman Rockwell Museum that have an international appeal. We are a small regional museum in a county that has a declining population of aging individuals where there were over a thousand nonprofits that were all vying for the same funding. And so was this the easy way out? By no means. Do I recommend that other institutions do this? Only as a last resort. Um, but I have to say the museum is now at a place where amazing things are now happening and the, uh, the potential is, is great. So, you know, it's a tough decision. You're going to get raked over the coals. One of the things though, and I, I'll, then I'll end here, but the, the reality is there are a very vocal group of museum world people that, that want to cast out an institution with public shame and treat it like a pariah when the institution is literally at its lowest point in its history, if it makes this decision that the Berkshire Museum did. And productive conversations just cannot happen when there's this pervasive meanness that overhangs every existential issue like this. And it doesn't help the broader museum field to create meaningful solutions and create partnerships and make needed changes in policies and laws and stewardship. I'm hopeful that the dialogue today will actually shift this perspective and may actually help generate more respect for one another and better policies for museums to actually evolve and ultimately broaden and better serve their communities. But the public shaming and the applauding when an artwork sells for less than it really should ultimately means that there's probably more artwork that needs to be sold. And that makes me so sad that the museum world wants to just trash, you know, individuals that choose to make this, this, this decision. And, um, you know, I hope 
that that changes for any museum or historical society or anything else, because this pandemic is not over. And uh, I don't think we're fully understanding what the ramifications are financially. They're predicting that a third of museums and historical sites are going to close because of this pandemic. Well, you and I can have a, you, I actually don't believe the AAM projection. I'm not nearly- <laughs> Well, I read it, so I, cause I do read their yeah. stuff, but you know, I hope not. No, but, I, not. Um, but um, and, and I do want to acknowledge that there have been questions in the chat about where is the community in this panel? Um, the session, the symposium organizers made a set of decisions about the structures of these panels. I don't think it's our place to question that and to talk about a topic that's not here. I wanna end with um, the question. This morning, Kaywin said, quoted the book, what got you here isn't going to get you there. So what's the future? Um, look like, not just for your museums, but museums in general, particularly regional museums, as regards these issues of stewardship and stewardship defined as Betsy did this morning, as both the care and the sharing, the engagement with community. So what's the future? Briefly, you've each got a couple minutes. Elizabeth? Oh, I wish I could look into that crystal ball. Um, I hope this is what I hope, and and I completely agree. You know what got us here to this point is not going to take us further. Um, I we can't rely on on the norm. I'm I'm hopeful. You know, from my perspective, and and as I'm looking across the field, that having these conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you know, not only within our collection, but within the museum profession itself, helps create stronger, more resilient institutions that appeal to um, a, a broader set of individuals than they ever have before. And that um, by bringing culture to everyone and that everyone has a, a greater appreciation for it, that they will become the donors, they will become the sustainers um, of our institutions and we won't have to have these kinds of discussions in the future, I hope. Thank you, Van. I think some of the same issues that um, I believe uh, were critical 10 years ago when I took the Berkshire Museum job are still critical today uh, and that is relevance, of course, which is also about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, it's also change dynamics, just understanding how much everything is changing. And also, I think it's very important for museums to think deeply about how to deliver experiences in ways that are familiar to the audiences. Uh, and so I think that the future um, now the financial underpinnings of making those changes to be in the future, to be successful in the future are, are still going to be a very major issue. Um, you know, the, the era of government support for museums that was like when I worked in New York, we had NISCA, we had the Department of Cultural Affairs in New York City and Massachusetts, you don't see that. You see some little bits and pieces of support, but not fundamental support. I worked at another museum where two thirds of the budget was supplied by the city of New York and another museum where two thirds of the budget was supplied by a county. So until that sort of three-legged stool formula for museum funding gets, gets worked out and whether people value it. And then the question becomes, is the marketplace gonna tell us what to do? Is, is Mao Wolf going to be the new model of what museums are like? I, I don't know, but I know the future is, um, problematic. The interesting thing is we have such amazing resources to deploy to make things interesting for museums in the future. And I just hope museums will have the, uh, the courage to do that. Jessica, quickly, what's the future? Sure. Um, I would love more Deborah Cass moments um, with artists, uh, more Parker Curry um, at the National Portrait Gallery with Michelle Obama's portrait. Um, 
I would love for us to think about our carbon footprint to be more equitable, to have a lower ba area, barrier of entry to the arts for, for everyone. Um, yep, that's... Thank you. Buzz, yeah. you were the one who raised it's, the it's, question. It's about the engagement. It's engaging everybody from your exhibits to uh, also educating your staff, the community, the board, as to how the decision-making process works and how boards work and what's the role of the board, especially in this day and age with equity inclusion and, and all of these tough decisions that are being faced. Um, it's educating how the process works so that there's none of this misinformation and these echo chambers that are that are so prevalent now on social media and they allow people to just keep listening to these loops but it's really educating you know what's the and having conversations about what's the point of having a museum what what's the goal what's the mission all of that what was that um, elizabeth quick pitch for your team's um, assessment of your institution don't you have a teen council doing an assessment of your board? Ah, yes. So yes, we have a, a teen council um, that we, uh, well, we, in addition to our teen council serving as a representative on our board of trustees, we also have teen representatives on our equity and engagement committee, which is a subcommittee of the board. So this is one of, uh, one of the, the, items that Jessica has really championed for the institution. And so um, we'll, we'll see, I haven't participated yet um, in the assessment. So hopefully they will uh, give us good marks. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, this has been terrific. Thank you, thank you for your honesty. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions. I'm sorry that when I answered questions, um, it made your question visible. Um, it was a little hitch in the technology that we didn't anticipate. And so we stopped answering questions, any specific questions in the Q&A function. Um, don't forget that tomorrow we start at 8.30, um, not at nine o'clock. Um, you can always check the bulletin board on the website for up-to-date changes and announcements and um, look in your email for um, that came in early this morning. Um, there were a couple of different versions of the email, but one of them had the links uh, to the various meetups tonight. Um, uh, one for uh, emerging professionals, one for board people. Um, I can't remember what they all are. Um, maybe our organizers will remind us. And um, look for those links if you've still have any energy left at the end of this long and productive day. And Emily, I think I'd bounce it back to you. Yes? Thank you. Yes, yes thank you. Um, thank you so much, Laura. Um, well, everyone who is uh, still with us at the end of this long day, this is the end of day one, unless you want to uh, hang on and do some socializing with us, um, uh, which as Laura, Laura said, uh, links can be found in the chat um, to those sessions, and they'll be starting in about 15 minutes. Um, just a few words before we close. What a day full of engaging discussion it has been um, with much food for thought to take us through to our second day tomorrow. So don't forget, we have another full day. I'd like to take a moment to say thank you so much to all of today's panelists and moderators for sharing their time, experience and wisdom with us. And to Kaywin Feldman who started us off with such a thought provoking keynote this morning. In reflecting on today, the themes that perhaps stood out to me the most uh, personally the most were those around empathy and responsibility. Um, in and around the many questions raised today related to mission and direct care uh, and the law, I think we could all feel a sense of urgency surrounding museums' responsibilities to be more sustainable um, and also the importance of decolonizing and diversifying from staff to boards to collections, our most important cultural institutions must represent who we are in addition 
to who we might have been in the past. One of the reasons we decided to organize this symposium um, in the first place grew out of the recognition um, of the need to bring the museum community together to listen to each other around these topics. Directors, curators, artists, trustees, academics, students, critics, we really need to listen better, more, and with empathy. To borrow the words a number, have, uh, number of people have said today, um, we need to do more sharing and caring. Um, in this era of political polarization, public protest, and increasing racially motivated violence across the United States, what role, what role will museums choose to play, both individually and collectively? It's such a complex question um, and one full of historical baggage, but I think the way forward always starts with conversation. And so I'm grateful to all those here who are committed to taking the discussion forward. I hope everybody, participant and panelist, has found something to take away with them from today's discussions. I know I have. Tomorrow is full of more opportunities to hear from leaders in the field, from the experiences of museums with parent organizations to the unique challenges facing historic sites. There is much more still to be discussed, much more listening to be done. I'd also like to draw your attention to opportunities to ask the lawyers and ask the auction houses. Uh, so please bring all of your most pressing questions. In addition, we will welcome Christopher Bedford, director of the Baltimore Museum of Art, who will deliver a keynote address in the afternoon. So we look forward to seeing you starting at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. Um, and one final reminder, if you wish, um, the uh, links for the Zoom social spaces uh, will be in the chat, as I said, starting at 545. Uh, and again, many thanks to everyone and have a wonderful evening. Thank <laughs> you.